I like starting with this slide of the picture of the state capitol, part of it because you know we've got a really beautiful capitol building. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt dedicated it, said it was a bully building. Um, so that uh, really is. But down here in the corner, there's a little white roof building with solar panels and they're the only solar panels in the entire capitol complex. And those are that's our office. <laughs> so we're this uh, um, little bastion of solar in this in the um, against the whole the whole weight of the capital. And sometimes sometimes it feels that way. This is actually a closer picture um, from up on our roof, looking over our new panels, recently upgraded panels here. But Pennsylvania, if you look at the energy numbers in Pennsylvania, and I won't read through all of these, what's instantly clear is we produce a lot of energy, but not a lot of solar. We have the capacity. We're just not getting, uh, we don't, we're not getting the systems built. We're not getting it installed. And there's a bunch of reasons why that is. Um, we'll start off, though, talking about why, as an environmental advocate, I'm particularly interested in solar. And, well, power, the PowerPoint conversion messed up my uh, slide, but that's okay. Um, if we look at where the carbon pollution is coming from in Pennsylvania, I mean, we want to get to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change goal of net zero by 2050 to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And if we look at where that carbon is coming from, you know, about a third of it is electric generation, about a third of it is transportation, and, you know, about a third is that industrial sector with some other things thrown in there. But if we're going to address this problem, certainly electric generation, the solution there is moving the grid away from polluting fossil fuels and to clean generation like solar. The solution for transportation is largely electrifying transportation and relying on a clean electric grid. And similarly for industrial, although it's a little bit harder, the solution uh, you know, to, to electrify what you can, even in residential, uh, moving home away from, uh, we have a lot of coal heat in Pennsylvania, coal, oil, gas, and move that to clean generation that relies on the electric generation grid. Now our grid used to be uh, not a clean grid at all. Uh, well, actually much sooner than 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, 90% of our generation came from coal and nuclear. Most of it was nuclear, most of it was coal. Uh, that's, changed an, excuse me, that's changed an awful lot uh, since the fracking boom. Now more than half of our generation comes from fracked gas. Uh, nuclear, we dropped a little bit because Three Mile Island closed. And coal dropped, went from more than, uh, you know, went from the largest single sector of our generation. Here it says 12%. And this is actually a little bit overly optimistic. Uh, part of the reason why is in um, 2021, there was a little bit of a resurgence in coal because of inflation and gas prices. But also we have five major coal plants left in Pennsylvania. And only one of them has yet to announce its retirement. So Homer City in Indiana County is the only plant that has yet to announce retirement, and that's been in and out of bankruptcy. So coal really isn't a factor in Pennsylvania anymore, and it's, it's rapidly decreasing. But the issue now is we still have basically very, very little renewable generation and a tremendous amount of fossil fuel generation coming, coming from gas. And the reason why this is happening, and this is, leads to some of our, um, why we support the policies we do, in the old days, if you were gonna build a coal fire power plant like Homer City, if you were gonna build a nuclear plant like Three Mile Island, you would have been an electric generation utility, a vertically integrated monopoly. You would have owned everything from the power plant to somebody's electric meter. And you would have gone to the public utility commission and said, I need to build a multi gigawatt power plant to serve my customers. It'll cost me X billion dollars. I'm gonna charge my customers this amount on their monthly bills. And that's going to guarantee a profit for me for building this plant. And the PUC would authorize that and the plant would get built. That doesn't happen anymore. Utilities do not own generation in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, to get a plant built or to operate a plant, it relies really on a uh, nonprofit corporation, an organization called PJM. That used to stand for Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland. And this picture is of their control center in Valley Forge, PA. If you get a chance to tour it, highly recommend it. It's like more impressive than the Bridge of the Enterprise. Um, it's, it's an amazing place to visit. But PJM runs the electric grid for all, of, all or part of 13 states and the District of Columbia. 
60 million people, their power, their reliability, where they get the generation relies on, relies on PJM's operation. If you own a power plant, if you own a coal-fired power plant, let's say, and you want to sell energy tomorrow, you have to put in a bid with PJM today. Well, you, you would have had to put in a bid by four o'clock today with PJM, and they're going to hold an auction. And what they do, so if you have renewable generation, wind, hydro, solar, if you have nuclear generation, you don't have fuel costs, you have very low marginal costs for operating. So you bid into the PJM grid at zero, one, maybe two cents a kilowatt hour, very low bid. If you have natural gas combined cycle, you're bidding in at two, three, four cents a kilowatt hour, coal, three, four, five, all the way up to you maybe you have a diesel generator and you're bidding in at 70 cents a kilowatt hour or more. So what PJM will do is they'll take all these bids, they'll predict how much energy they need tomorrow, and they'll call them up in order from cheapest to most expensive. And whenever they get the amount of power they need, that establishes the market clearing price. And everybody that cleared the market gets that price. So if the market clears at seven cents a kilowatt hour, you get seven cents, even if you bid in at zero. Um, it's a pretty effective system. Well, they do this again every day, the day ahead auction. They also do a spot, a separate spot market every five minutes. Um, so they run these auctions every five minutes. And then there's other auctions for other services that they run. But this is how we get our generation. And it's really good at driving prices down. And it has kept power prices pretty low. What's challenging about it is it doesn't necessarily price the things that we want. So when we talk about clean generation, they're not priced in this. There's no premium for clean generation um, as part of this system. Also, if you are going to build a solar facility and can interconnect it to the uh, wholesale grid, and you go to a bank and you want to get a loan to build this solar system, uh, the bank is gonna say, well, who's gonna buy your power? And if you say, well, I don't know who's gonna buy my power until four o'clock the day before, the bank is not gonna be inclined to loan you money for that system, and by and large, they don't. And the systems that we get built, at least the larger systems, tend to be ones where there's some form of a power purchase agreement or some sort of guarantee, because that's the only way these things get financed. Um, I will, a brief digression to the types of generation. I, sometimes I don't know how, especially with Zoom, I don't know what level the audience is coming in at, but I'm sure most people in this room are aware of Penn State's project, their BP Light Source project. Um, you know, this is what we would call grid scale solar. It's often called utility scale solar. In Pennsylvania, that's a little confusing because utilities don't own any generation and people think utility, it's owned by the utility. Um, so we tend to call it grid scale, um, but these are very large systems, mostly more than three megawatts. You know, certainly up, we're pushing a hundred megawatts at this point. Um, the largest ones in out of Pennsylvania are over 200 megawatts at this point. Very, very large systems, almost always ground mounted, very cheap to install. Um, these, these are prices that I quoted there coming from a recent NREL report. Generally, you think cheaper than a dollar a kilowatt hour to install these systems. Um, on the other side, you have distributed solar. This is another picture of our new rooftop or our upgraded rooftop panels in our office. Um, these are connected to your distribution system. They tend to be very small. They could be as big as five megawatts for a commercial system, but generally they're below three. Uh, home systems, four, five, six kW are pretty typical systems. They could actually be 50 kW for residential systems in Pennsylvania, but very, very rarely would that happen. Um, mostly rooftop, although some are ground mounted and quite a bit more expensive to install. Um, the price here, uh, $2.65, that's an average, but it varies widely. Uh, I did a rooftop system, I installed my own rooftop system a couple of years ago and it was uh, below $2 a KW uh, after, uh, after the tax credit. And you're seeing systems in the basically two to $3 range right now to get these systems installed. So 
increasing solar generation in Pennsylvania. And this is where I might be copying some of the stuff that Alan Landis might've talked about last week. Uh, Alan, Alan and I worked together on this report. <laughs> uh, we had about 300 stake, more than 300 stakeholders that were trying to answer the question of how do we get to 10% solar by 2030? Uh, we came up with a few general pathways to do that. And there were two broad scenarios, a 65% grid scale and a 90%. The 65% grid scale would end up being, um, you know, rely more heavily on distributed generation. It would create many more jobs because it takes a lot more jobs to on the distributed side, but it would be um, more expensive. The 90% grid scale uh, solar, fewer jobs, uh, much, uh, much less expensive to uh, put in that kind of generation. Both were possible. And to get to both of those, we looked at a number of different strategies. And what I'll do is I'll kind of run through the strategies and then we'll kind of break down about the politics of them and how they interact. And I will, I will not explain them all as I go along. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, we'll talk more about portfolio standards. Access to capital is actually a very big thing that it's important a lot of different strategies relate to. You know, that could be doing things like forming a green bank. It could be having some fund to buy down uh, interest rates on loans to make loans more accessible. It could be direct grants. Um, it could actually be tax incentives and other things. Um, carbon pricing, we'll talk about that a little bit later in context of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and where that's going. Uh, siting and land use, not much has happened around this in Pennsylvania. There are some things in the federal, uh, recent federal in, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act that's going to impact some of these land use issues. And we'll talk a little bit about them. And, and we'll talk about what tax incentives are out there. Again, that's mostly federal. The, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act extended and expanded the uh, investment tax credit. So now you get a 30% uh, tax credit for installing solar systems. It had dropped to 26, and now it's back up to 30. Uh, specifically for distributed generation, uh, we'll talk about uh, net metering and virtual net metering, community solar, alternative rate making. Property assist clean energy is already is already passed in Pennsylvania. We already have this in many counties. If you are a, if you're a commercial entity, you can purchase energy efficiency or renewable energy um, equipment installations, put in improvements, and pay for it as part of a tax assessment. And that tax assessment runs with the land. So if you sell your building, whoever buys the building essentially pays off the remainder of the, um, the, the remainder of the tax assessment on this. What's nice about this is the default rate on tax, tax assessments are much lower. So it's a little bit easier to get financing for this and you get better financing rates and can get projects built that way. Um, and interconnection issues, um, there's, in some utility territories, it's uh, uh, particularly difficult to get interconnection. Uh, Pico in particular has a lot of 4 kV lines, which are the older, lower power lines. And um, if you put too much solar in one area, it's um, you could overvolt the lines and they have issues with that. So they have restrictions. Um, so in improving their, the distribution system and fixing the interconnection problems are something that we're working on. For grids, for uh, grid scale strategies, won't go into a whole lot of details on these, but the uh, long-term contracts is a big one. This is addresses that issue where the bank, you know, isn't going to loan you money because you're not going to say you can't prove to them you have a buyer for the power. Our electric generation utilities are required by law to buy power for customers that don't make other arrangements. And they are required to use, to buy that power using what the law says, a prudent mix of contracts that results in the best rate over time. So the law says they're supposed to use a mix of contracts. And what has happened is the utilities, because we went for a fairly long period with really flat electric rates, they've recently spiked, but they were flat for a long time. So the utilities did not enter into long-term contracts for solar, even though it could insulate their customers from potential cost spikes and variability. Um, what we would like to see is a rule saying that utilities 
actually longer term contracts, six, eight, 10 year contracts should be part of that prudent mix because it does, uh, it does provide a hedge against variation in fossil fuel prices. When we see these big uh, power purchase agreements for these facilities, often the entities buying these, putting in these PPAs, you know, many times they do it because they say they want to, you know, meet sustainability goals, clean energy goals. Sometimes they're actually lowering their energy spend in the process of doing it. But in the case of the city of Philadelphia, they explicitly said they weren't lowering their energy spend. What they were doing is hedging against volatility. They were locking in their energy spend. So they know that, you know, they weren't, they were looking forward and not expecting gas prices to stay low. Uh, and um, they actually got a pretty good deal because gas prices spiked uh, recently. Um, grid modernization, uh, won't talk too much about that. There isn't a whole lot in Pennsylvania politics that's going on, but there is at the federal level uh, with FERC and with PJM, which is our grid, our transmission operator. But that's, that gets a little bit away from the state politics. So those were the main strategies. So what I'll do now looking at them is I'll pick out some of the specific uh, issues and talk a little bit more about them and how the policies are working around them on the ground in Pennsylvania today. So net metering for distributed generation, this is the basis of you know, the biggest funding stream for somebody that wants to put solar on their house. The system is pretty simple. You know, you have an inverter, you know, that turns the solar power to the, um, to your, um, you know, house power. You use whatever you need and what excess you have, you get to sell to your utility. Uh, at night, you know, cloudy days, things like that, where you're not producing all the power you need, you buy power from electricity. Uh, you buy that electricity from the utility. Now, Pennsylvania has a really good law for this. We have actually one of the strongest laws in the country for this. Um, and we have since 2004. And this is the key part of what the law says, is energy generation from net metered customer generators shall receive the full retail value for all energy produced on an annual basis. I don't know how many other lawyers there are in the room, but you know, when I read that, the first question is, what is full retail value? The um, law, the rule doesn't say. <laughs> the Public Utility Commission has never said. There's no case law in Pennsylvania that tells us what full retail value is. Um, it's never. It's you know we don't we do not know. What happens in reality is you get something less than the full retail rate. And if the full retail rate is the full retail value. We don't know. Um, for example, uh, the, I have solar panels on my house. And if I, in August, I generated more energy than I needed. So that power from August essentially rolled over in September and on a per kilowatt hour basis. So if I generated 10 kW, uh, kWh more than I needed in August, then that comes off my September bill. And that keeps rolling forward um, until May. At, at the end of May, why May? It's just a quirk in the rule. But at the end of May, if you have net generation, you get paid at what's known as the price to compare. If you look at your electric bill, it'll say PTC or price to compare. That's the basically the wholesale generation and transmission costs. So certainly less than the retail rate. Um, and that's what you get paid for net metering. The, um, yeah, so something less than full retail rate, and we're acting like it's full retail value. That is what full retail value is under, under this law. Now, the electric generation utilities don't like this. They don't like this at all. <laughs> um, the, this is a quote here that came from uh, Donna Clark uh, with Energy Association for PA. They're the trade association for uh, the electric utilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's other organizations that work as trade associations for utilities like the Edison Electric Institute. Um, they have spent 
an enormous amount of money in Pennsylvania and other states fighting net metering. Often it's ratepayer money that they are spending <laughs> because um, as ratepayers, we pay you know, utilities essentially get rate recovery for, be, for belonging to trade associations. And so we pay for their advocacy to fight net metering. And what they want is to pay wholesale rates. So, which is not, it's not surprising. That's, you know, if um, they want to sell electricity, they want to buy it for as cheap as they possibly can. Um, so they've been doing a lot of advocacy around, around opposing, um, opposing that metering, trying to get rid of this full retail value language and really blocking anything else related to net metering. And we'll talk about some of those other things as we go along here. Now, there are solutions um, that we could deal with, that, that could help deal with this problem. Um, a big one is really answering this value question. There have been other states that have done what they've done called value of solar studies, where they've looked at all of these things, all of these factors. Um, often, particularly when they count public health and environmental benefits, they find the value of distributed generation tends to be far higher than the retail rates. Um, but there's other things besides public health and environmental benefits. There's wholesale price suppression. You know, back at the beginning when I talked about the market clearing price for the grid, well, if you take your house and you no longer have demand from your house, you know, you have by some you know, small amount lower that grid demand. And when the grid demand lowers, the grid clears at a lower price and everybody pays a lower price because um, you know, you've moved away the demand from the, that, that uh, demand side of the equation. Um, there's avoided costs that utilities and even the grid don't need to pay when you have people that are, are no longer putting demand on the grid you don't necessarily have to build out your system to be as robust. In systems, the, the more expensive part of the system tends to be what it costs to, high, to deal with those very high demand load days. It isn't the day-to-day -day operation of the grid. And to the extent that you can lower investment in that, you're providing a benefit to the grid. There's another benefit that we don't see quantified very often with solar, and that's that Having solar power in your community. Now, the uh, the uh, uh, Energy Association of Pennsylvania, when they were opposing it, they go to the they go to the legislators and say the problem with net metering is cross subsidization. So, because they have to pay me more than wholesale prices for the power that I'm uh, selling back to the utility, that means my neighbors are having to pay my share. So that's the problem that they're trying to solve, and that's why that's that's why they're you know how they're casting the problem to want to get rid of net metering. Um, there are benefits even for the neighbors besides the other ones we've listed, and this you know buying local factor is one of them. So if my electric bill went from one hundred and fifty dollars a month uh, in the summertime before solar panels to fifteen dollars a month after the solar panels. I probably should make sure that whatever that difference is goes right back into investment accounts. But as a practical matter, when people have more money in their pocket, they spend money. They spend money and they spend money locally. So they go out to restaurants in the community. They go, you know, do activities. They, they do other things in their neighborhood. By just the fact that you have people that are generating your own electricity, if you are bu essentially buying electricity from your neighbors, it's very similar to buying fruit from a farm stand or vegetables from a farm stand down the street. You're keeping money in that local economy. And there is a non-zero value to that that has not been quantified you know, in, in detail in Pennsylvania, but there's a value there. The other way to address the, uh, well, the other part of the utility argument is aside from cross-subsidization, it's a well, what happens when everybody goes solar? And they say, well, let, we paint this picture. If everybody goes solar, everybody's plugged into the grid to have it there when they need it, but they're not actually buying any power, so they're not paying for it. So that system is unsustainable. And part of that is a straw man argument. 
Uh, and there's no reason that, that, has, that we have to do it that way. I mean, I pay right now $15 and some odd cents a month is the minimum fixed rate that you pay every month, no matter what. You know, it's possible to, you know, when you have the connection to the grid that you're not using, it's possible, you know, some of that should probably be a fixed rate that you're paying. You're paying for the benefit whether you actually um, use it or not. Um, it's probably good that most of that is paid on a volumetric per kilowatt hour basis because that incentivizes people to conserve electricity and do other good things. But we can adjust the way we make our rates to compensate. Nobody is saying that utilities shouldn't get paid for the service they provide and they shouldn't be paid a fair amount for the service they provide. Uh, it's just that we can do that and we can encourage solar generation and net metering. But this fight continues. Um, the other big program we have in Pennsylvania, we already have passed, and again, since 2004, actually the same law that enabled net metering, is what's in Pennsylvania is called the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standards Act, or AEPS. In every other state, this is called the Renewable Portfolio Standards Act. We call it alternative and not renewable in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania's system has coal in it big surprise uh, being Pennsylvania. But essentially what this, what this does is there's a couple different tiers. There's tier one, which is generally clean, um, that says 8% of our generation by the summer of 2021, so last summer, had to come from clean sources. And of that, you know, mostly wind, some hydro in there. Of that, half a percent had to come from solar. So um, that's the portfolio standard. That's our energy mix. It has to come from those, uh, tier one has to come from those sources. Now the utilities don't own any generation and even the electric generation service providers that are non-utilities that can sell you electricity don't um, have to own any generation. So the way this system works is when somebody has solar on their roof and they generate one megawatt hour of solar, we split that megawatt into the energy component and the clean attribute. And that clean attribute for solar, it becomes what they call an SREC, a solar renewable energy credit, technically in PA, solar alternative energy credit, but nobody calls it that. Um, so we have an energy, you know, one megawatt hour of energy and a one megawatt hour SREC. The energy, that's net metered like we talked about, um, like any other energy, but the SREC, you basically go, you tend to work through an aggregator that takes these SRECs, bundles them together, sells them to people with a compliance obligation, uh, whatever they sell for, right now it's around $20 for a solar SREC in Pennsylvania. Um, that money comes back to the uh, household. So I, in Pennsylvania right now, a household, typical household system is going to probably get about $200 a year from this program to help fund the solar panel, their solar panels. We've got some um, uh, difficulties with this program in Pennsylvania. One is the cap, that 8% is very, very low. New Jersey's standard is 50%. Um, New York's is up there. Most states are much, much higher than we are. Um, and even that solar, the solar, solar carve out of half a percent, it's very tiny and it's not getting bigger. It had ramped up from 2004 to 2021, but we've reached the end of the ramp and it's not getting bigger. So now the only driver to increase solar particularly is, well, we did have a change a while back that it used to be anywhere in the PGM grid could generate solar, and now it has to be in Pennsylvania. It's some of the old grandfathered out-of-state systems are retiring. But other than that, we've reached our cap in Pennsylvania. It's not driving, and in fact, we have downward pressure on these SREC prices. So as we go forward, it's going to, be, it's going to become uh, less and less power over time. So we reached its caps, the targets are too low. And the other, big flaw with this is it subsidizes polluting uh, generation. This is where Bitcoin comes in. Um, we have a company in Pennsylvania, Stronghold Digital Mining, recently bought 
two waste coal fire power plants, uh, uh, Scrubgrass and Panther Creek in Pennsylvania, about 90 megawatts each. And they have in their report saying that they're buying 57,000 Bitcoin miners. It's a miner like that. It's about the size of a toaster, weighs about 20 pounds, uses about three times the energy of your household. And one of the reasons they're funding this as what they told their, uh, what they told the SEC in their filings last summer is 60% of their generation costs come from PA taxpayer and rate payer subsidies. And that 60% of costs is very much, uh, the largest piece is a, the AAPS program because tier two of AAPS includes waste coal. Now their claim is, well, what we're taking these waste coal piles and we're digging them up and we're getting rid of them. So we're protecting the land and the water. They're also burning it and it's going into the air and it's a significant climate pollutant. It's much more lower energy value. So more polluting per megawatt hour than regular coal. Um, so the dirtiest energy source we have in Pennsylvania and heavily subsidized by AAP, the AAPS program. So when we are out there talking to legislators saying, we need to increase the AAPS, particularly for solar. Uh, we need to in, do more to incentivize installation of solar. What we hear is, but there's already millions and millions of dollars being spent on the AAPS program. And lots of it is because we're funding people to burn coal. Um, so it becomes, it becomes very, very challenging. Um, so a, net metering and AAPS, those are two programs we already have. Uh, community solar is a program we should have, but we don't yet. Uh, about five years ago, a group came, actually came to my office and said, what would it take to make community solar happen in PA? And the, I sketched out a draft piece of legislation, and it really it takes about four sentences that we have to change in our existing legislation to make this happen. And what community solar does is it, it provides solar access to people that can't put solar on their roof. Right now, 50 to 75% of Pennsylvanians don't have solar access. They live in multifamily housing, so they don't have a lot of roof space. They rent, um, they simply can't afford it. We have old housing stock that doesn't have the roof structure that's necessary or doesn't have the wiring that's necessary. Um, you just live in the shade, uh, you know, live, live in a you know, tree-filled community. There's many reasons why we don't have access. In about 16 other states, they have passed a community solar bill. And what this does is it lets a developer come in and say, I will build a centralized system in, you know, in somewhere in the utility territory. And I will go to individuals and I will sign up subscribers. So maybe I can't put solar on my roof, but maybe I will instead uh, subscribe to at least a 10 kW share of this big centralized system. Now the developer builds, owns, operates the system, sends the energy to the utility. And what the utility sends to me is, well, the energy I need, plus a bill credit for my share of that generation. So it's basically net metering, uh, but it's net metering where the system doesn't have to be on top of my roof. The closest thing we have in Pennsylvania to this right now is a system called virtual meter aggregation, where if you have a house where you can't put solar, but someplace within two miles, you have another piece of property where you can put solar, you can net the two together. Um, that's not very convenient and it's very limiting and doesn't happen very often. Um, but what this would do is allow developers to come in and you know, build projects. And if they can get the subscribers to sign up, they can get financing and they can get these projects built. Um, we've been trying for now just, just over five years um, to get this done. We've um, have legislation introduced in the last two sessions. And we just heard it's not gonna get done this session. Um, 
One of the big reasons is uh, utility. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is utility opposition to this, and it's because of that bill credit. Because much like they hate net, hate net metering, they don't want to pay anything other than the wholesale rate for power. Um, and they, you know, we, that it goes back to the same net metering arguments of you know, there's other values there. There's plenty of other values there, and even in community solar, we're not people aren't even necessarily asking for the full retail rate. Or the full retail value, uh, because the economies of scale would make lower bill credit still very, very cost effective, uh, but strong utility opposition. What the utilities have proposed, or Duquesne Light in particular has been the leader on this, is something that they called local solar, which doesn't exist anywhere else that I'm aware of. But basically this says, if the utility wants to, they can put out a request for proposal to a developer to build a solar installation. And then that energy comes back to the utility. And then the utility can sell that energy to customers. Now, the problems here, you know, this is basically, this rule says the utilities can do whatever they want. Do they have to do it? No. <laughs> uh, developer wants to build a project. Utility just says, no, nah, we don't want to build a project. And that doesn't get built. Um, there's zero competition. So now under the last version of this, the language, they would say that they would guarantee that that cost would be lower than what the, what the um, customers would be paying anyway. But you know, it might be a cent lower. There's really zero incentive for it to be anything more than that. Um, so you know, this is you know, just saying you know, the utilities, it's we don't have utility ownership of generation anywhere in Pennsylvania today. This is really a backdoor to utility ownership for generation. Um, it's either that or it's just a introduced as a, as a method to confuse the issue and let legislators say, well, we passed the local solar thing. We've done solar this session. We're not going to do anything. And that very well may have been why this was passed, not with an intent to actually build anything, but just as a uh, just as something to muddle the conversation around around actually getting community solar uh, community solar passed. Um, talking about how to get stuff through the legislature. So I said we have been working on that for, um, you know, why have we been working on that program for five years and have not yet been able to get a bill passed? Um, and if you remember the, uh, you know, old schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law. I think most of the people here, <laughs> here, here remember that. There's this sense that if you have a good argument and you go to the legislature with a good argument and your argument is like a winning argument, then you can get it passed. And that just isn't the way our legislature works. <laughs> um, we have a whole lot of obstacles. Now, the general process is we have to find a legislature legislators to sponsor the um, sponsor the bill and they would put out a co-sponsorship memorandum to, to the usually both caucuses and say hey please join me on this we need to do XYZ um, and they need and they sponsor the bill they draft the bill they get it introduced then the bill goes to committee the first session uh, when we tried to get community solar passed, it died in the committee. The committee chair had simply said, I'm not running the bill. We had, a, we, if we could get the bill to the floor, we would get a majority support for the bill. <laughs> uh, we would have, probably have a majority of the Republican caucus supporting the bill, but we didn't have the committee chair on the committee it went to, and that was enough to kill it. Um, the, um, so you get, assuming you can get it by committee, you have to bring it to the floor um, you have to bring it to a floor vote. Uh, it actually has to make it to the floor three times. It's gotta be read on three different days. There is an informal rule in the federal side, it's called the Hastert rule, named after Denny Hastert, former speaker of the house. Uh, typically in effect, when there's a Republican, uh, uh, Republican legislature, um, but it does, to some extent, it happens with both parties. The Hastert rule says, no bill makes it to the floor unless it has majority support of the majority party. So it it's pretty much works that way. It's not a hard and fast rule. They can break it if they want to. 
but it pretty much works that we do not get bills to the floor of the Pennsylvania House unless a majority of Republicans support the bills. So what they want to avoid is a situation where you have all of the Democrats supporting a bill and a dozen Republicans support the bill. Well, you would pass if it made it to the um, if it made it to the floor, but those bills never make it to the floor. Um, so you've got to go to the floor three times. Um, on the in the initially in committee, and when it's um, on second consideration in the in on the floor, it can be amended. Um, what we'll see often is a gut and replace amendment. So you'll have a good bill moving. Um, you'll get it through the committee. It'd be great. I got this bill through the committee. And then everything you liked just got stripped out of it. That bill disappears. It's replaced by a completely different set of language. It has to be the same subject. So, um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, none of your language has to stay there. So you have to survive these gut and replace amendments. Then it goes to the other chamber. And often, now in Pennsylvania, we've got Republican control of the House and the Senate. And often the fighting between the House and the Senate can be just as vicious as the fighting between the Republicans and the Democrats in any one caucus. Um, you know, if, you know, in these, what, we'll, what we've seen in bills, if a bill moves through the House and makes it to the floor in the Senate, well, perhaps there's a similar Senate version of that bill that isn't the House version of that bill, and the Senate decides that they want to move their version because they want to essentially let their member, their caucus member, get the benefit with their electorate of saying, my bill moved. So they will take, they will let the House bill die and they will move the Senate bill back to the House. And then the House says, we don't like that because we want to give our guy the uh, benefit of having this, uh, of having this bill move. So Nothing moves, and the bill dies <laughs> um, because neither neither chamber will move it to the other chamber. You get through all of that, and then you get it to the governor's office. So you try not to be very depressing about this, but it is very very difficult. We had a bill with um, far with the majority of the Republican caucus co-sponsored the bill and could not get it to move. <laughs> um, because of just this sort of politics. It is very, very, very challenging to move things. Um, on the good side, <laughs> um, we've got some really great talking points when it talks about getting solar and clean energy. It is popular. Um, it, it solves an awful lot of problems. We really like it. Uh, you know, people really like it. It pulls really well. Um, it is very. We have some really, really powerful and well-funded oppositions. We talked about the utilities and their trade associations fighting net metering. Uh, we have the anti-environmental think tanks. You might have heard organizations like ALEC, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council. There's a group called the State Policy Network. Their Pennsylvania arm is called the Commonwealth Foundation. Uh, that are constantly fighting clean energy um, and climate change uh, rules. We have fossil fuel companies. And the fossil fuel companies actually, they tend to be quiet in this. We have more gas lobbyists in Harrisburg than we have legislators. So the gas industry, there's more lobbyists working for them than there are, than there are people for them to talk to. Um, but they're very quiet about this. They rarely will come out and, you know, with a big, you know, press release. But what's going to what they do do is they fund very intensive lobbying efforts, and they fund these think tanks and other organizations um, to attack clean energy. And we see it in a lot of different ways. Um, the big, you know, overarching thing we say it, it's it's uh, FUD. It's right, raising fear and uncertainty and doubt around clean energy. And this is done. This is done in a lot of different ways. Um, the straw man arguments, uh, they want to, you know, they want you to be living in the cold. They want you to be living in the dark. Uh, they are doing this because they want to control you. Um, we hear that argument from legislators all the time. Um, outright climate change denial. Um, I've been to more than one committee where um, a, a, one of the legislators, a committee member said, well, Michael Mann is a liar. <laughs> 
Um, so, um, and um, so it's actually moved a bit. For a, for a while there, it was, you know, the pause on global warming and the, you know, the climate scientists are lying and the climate scientists are in it for the money. We're hearing less of that now. Now we're hearing more of it's the, the climate is always changing um, kind of argument. And there's nothing we can do about it. So we might as well burn gas and, and things like that. It's, the, it's moving a little bit into those doomism arguments. Um, you know, just outright lying and conspiracy theories. That's some of that is the, uh, you know, you're hearing uh, from legislators this about, you know, uh, liberals who are doing this to control you. Um, we've had um, and some, um, some really, um, some really crazy ones there. Um, another area that we call concern trolling that we're hearing, and this is really, it's in the last session where this one is really boomed. It's not attacking solar, but it's saying, well, they're just concerned about, well, solar panels have chemicals in them and chemicals are bad. We had uh, now Senator Chris Dush, he was Representative Chris Dush um, when he was uh, sat on the Environmental Resources and Energy Committee. And at one committee hearing, he said, solar panels have chemicals. Chemicals can leach into the ground, but coal, coal is just compost. <laughs> so, well, is coal compost? It's really, really old compost. Um, I did look it up and the EPA official guidance says not to put coal on your compost pile. So <laughs> there, that, that does actually appear in, in, in EPA guidance. So we, we hear things, um, it's those sorts of arguments. The other one we heard um, last, uh, really starting this past year is um, cadmium. Cadmium is mined using child labor in Africa. That's bad, so we can't have solar panels. Now, there's some issues with that. Solar panels don't have cadmium by and large. Lithium ion batteries do, solar panels don't. Um, and the solution to that is pretty simple. You know, saying I like solar panels is not equivalent to saying I'm in favor of child labor, ex you know, child you know, exploitation in Africa. We're not saying that. You can fix the problem of you know, exploitation in Africa or solar panels are made in China and China is doing, you know, terrible things. You can fix those problems by, you know, working with the State Department, by investing in local development of these systems, by doing any number of other things and still have solar panels. But that's not the point here. The point here is using this, uh, are using these concerns to attack the clean energy in industry. And that's really been uh, the, the, the strong point. Uh, that in their argument lately is that, or those attacks. The other one is, well, what happens at the end of life of your solar panels? You know, what do you do? We don't have a massive recycling industry for solar panels right now, which is true, we don't. Um, about, well, 75% of a solar panel is glass and aluminum, and we do have a recycling industry for that, but the rest of it, we don't. Uh, but part of the reason is there isn't a whole lot of solar panels in that waste stream to be recycled. Um, I started this by saying we had just replaced the solar panels on our roof in our office. We actually doubled the power of our, or doubled our generation in the same footprint um, because the, pan, um, uh, the panels are th that much more efficient today. Um, and what did we do with our old solar panels? We donated to somebody that's gonna reuse them. They were 19 years old, they weren't, by today's standards, they're you know 100 watt panels. They're not great panels, but if somebody has an RV and wants to you know, basically charge their cell phone in their RV or on their boat or something like that, they love these things. They actually have a value. You can buy them on eBay. These all these panels. There's a robust market for these for the you know reuse for these panels. Um, so they aren't going to be recycled. Um, at some point, they will be, and at some point, we do need to develop. A, a better recycling infrastructure for these sorts of things. Um, but as, when we actually get things that are actually end of life, uh, that's more likely to happen. Solar panels are kind of like LED light bulbs. Are these, yeah, these look like LEDs these days where end of life in a solar panel means it generates like 85% of the amount of energy it did when it was new. It doesn't, they tend to 
go on indefinitely. Some of the ones these days are guaranteed for 35 years. Um, and it may last, they may last much longer than that. Um, wrapping this up quickly, I wanted to touch on Re Reggie. Um, so if it's hard to do stuff through legislation, let's, you know, can we do it through regulation? Governor Wolf just tried this with uh, carbon pricing. You know, basically states create a carbon cap that goes to an auction. People that want to pollute have to buy the right to pollute. They don't just get to pollute for free. The money goes back to the states and that can be invested. It lowers pollution by one, capping emissions and also investing in things like clean energy, funding some of those access to capital things we talked about at the beginning. Um, Pennsylvania passed this regulation. This is like, I won't talk through this, but this is the timeline of how long it took. He, the governor said, we're gonna do it in 2017 and we're right now under a preliminary injunction, we're fighting in court to actually get this rule to go into effect. We didn't participate in the September auction. We may or may not participate in the December auction. Um, basically, the governor moved this through the program. The legislature has done everything they can do to block it. They actually had a resolution of disapproval to kill the regulation, but the uh, governor vetoed it. Um, we do not have a legislative veto in Pennsylvania. The legislature cannot tell the DEP or a regulatory agency they can't do something. The Supreme Court, just like the US Supreme Court has said, the legislature gets its power through bicameralism and presentment, working together in both houses and showing it to the governor and getting the governor's approval. So the governor said, nope, and they don't have two thirds majority to overrule the governor. So the rule went into effect. So what we've had now, and this is, a, this is a current event, Senate Bill 106 started as a constitutional amendment to just change how we pick our Lieutenant Governor. Right about the same time when the legislature realized they didn't have the votes to block it, they've added to this constitutional amendment a legislative veto to say that the legislature can kill regulations and not ask for the governor's approval on it. That happened in December. Now in July, same, Bill now has, there's no right to an abortion in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so you may ask, and I'm not going to, to you know, certainly argue the abortion issue up here, but you may ask, what does the abortion issue have to, have to do with a legislative veto? And pretty clearly what, what's going on here is the stuff at the bottom is, you know, legislative veto, voter ID, auditing elections. This is stuff that the legislature wants and has not been able to get past the governor's veto. And looking into the next election, we'll see maybe they will, you know, you know, have not be, still not be able to get it past the governor's veto. So by going through a constitutional amendment, this gets presented directly to the voters without the government's involvement. So by putting the abortion language in there, what they're hoping to do is get enough of the base out to vote for these things that they get the legislative veto, they get mandatory voter ID, they get election audits, and they get the things that they couldn't do through the democratic process. Um, so current event, this is gonna be on the ballot uh, next time you vote. <laughs> It has to pass in two separate uh, sessions. Um, so it'll pass in this session. It'll be on the ballot in this session and then the legislature will have to pass it in the next session. And if it does, it's part of our constitution. Um, so and we've already seen this legislative uh, maneuver happen to um, now the, go the governor of Pennsylvania cannot do a sh COVID shutdown again, basically. After 30 days, the legislature can overrule the governor. And that was done by one of these constitutional amendments. So, you know, we have the constitution, we have this, you know, system, and there's efforts afoot to make it even harder to get energy, clean energy um, installed. So I will stop there if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have time for a few quick questions. Thank you for such an informative talk. Yes. Yeah, you, you mentioned the net metering, and uh, I think California has a similar rule that Pennsylvania does where the utilities are required to buy electricity back at the retail price. Yeah. 
my understanding is there's a lawsuit out in California right now filed by ratepayers, and they argue that 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 law is basically having poor people subsidize the rich yeah. because only wealthy people can afford the solar panels on their on their houses. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a version of that same thing of that cross subsidization argument. The Edison Electric Institute, one of the utility trade associations, has been one of the big groups pushing that. Now, one California is a little bit differently situated in that they have a tremendous amount of solar, so you're actually seeing some of these effect you know potential effects of so many people have solar that it's affecting you the utility rate making. They're a lot closer to that. We're in Pennsylvania, we're nowhere close to having enough solar for there to be a, really a measurable effect on rates. But the solution there, again, isn't necessarily get rid of net metering. It is, you know, doing things to solve the problem. How do you how do you address equity issues? How do you make it affordable? Things like community solar, um, and have other programs so people that can't write a check for twenty thousand dollars can still get solar. And it's it's a challenge, but. We do that for solar electric vehicles is another place. Philly had that issue where um, essentially it was like buy electric vehicle and get your own parking space. Uh, it was not very popular, but there's other solutions to that. Thank you. We have a question from the online audience um, from Kelly. Doesn't the IAR include community solar where the homeowners can buy the solar, not lease? The, um, the, Inflation, yeah, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, yeah. it does, it actually, there's, inf there's incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act for community solar, specifically incentives for community solar on marginal land. So not putting it on prime farmland um, won't happen in Pennsylvania because we don't have a law on allowing it. So if we had, if we could have it in Pennsylvania, if we can pass this law, then we would see benefits from the IRA, but we won't until, we, until that passes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, we'll go over here and then one back here. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. Um, so as an individual homeowner resident, a lot of this makes my head spin. So if I'm contemplating um, installing solar on my house, there's so many factors, there's incentives, there's, is there enough light at my house? What things cost? What do you what do you recommend to someone who's contemplating doing this to kind of synthesize it down and help? Um, well, make if, a decision? If, if you're moderately, moderately technical, uh, the NREL National Renewable Energy Laboratory has a website called PV Watts. If you search PV Watts NREL, you can actually like draw a box around your roof on a map and say what could I expect to generate. So that should give you a pretty good ballpark number of what you could get from solar in your house. Um, beyond that, it's you know it's uh, shopping around with installers, <laughs> and you'll see a lot of different options um, that people will get, give you. You should be able to get prices down with the uh, current thirty percent tax credit below two dollars a watt for residential. It can be higher than that if you want DC optimizers and microinverters and all these other things. Um, often you don't need that, <laughs> um, but you know if you're around that two dollar a watt range, you're probably getting a pretty good deal today. I had another question. One of the things I learned from your talk is that the utilities don't own the power generation stations, at nope. least in Pennsylvania. And I guess my question is twofold: one, is that true in other states as well? And two, is there a downside of having the utilities own the power generation? It's true in uh, in a number of other states, not all of them. Uh, there's states that what they call have restructured electric markets. Um, Pennsylvania, there was a raft of restructuring where everybody was running to restructuring. Pennsylvania restructured, uh, New York restructured, and a few other states did. And then Enron happened. <laughs> and that gave people a distaste for that. They were in the gas market, but it was the same sort of restructuring uh, situation. Um, and Basically, everyone stopped. <laughs> um, the good side about a utility-operated system is your you, your public utility commission. You know, ours could theoretically say clean energy is one of our goals. 
build clean energy. Well, and they would have a guaranteed source of income. Yeah. Pay, pay, that, that was one of the yeah. problems you mentioned. Yeah. Right? Um, so that would be that would be possible. There's challenges, though, when you have a the, all public utility commissions, there's an issue with regulatory capture where often the commissioners are former utility people. Um, and it's very difficult to move things in the estates, even when the public utility commission could theoretically order them to do it. <laughs> they often don't. And what you tend to get is stagnant um, systems. Uh, South Carolina is one where they're their utility rate payers, I think, are still paying for a nuclear power plant that's way over budget um, because they were essentially forced into it. So the, it could be better. It's not necessarily. All right. Thank you. I think we'll end it there because it's five o'clock. Um, oh, one more online question. Okay. We'll do one more. Um, okay. Chris Forrest, has the social cost of carbon been considered as one of the benefits of solar? Um, we certainly consider it. Has the legislature? No. Which number do you use? <laughs> um, yeah, it, no. It's it, even things like the carbon pricing rule, the the Reggie rule. They're not getting the social cost. That's you know they're not getting that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we are going to end it there. Um, please stay tuned. We have a lot more talks in this series. Who will who will hopefully touch on some other topics that you raised here? Caitlin Spangler is going to come next week, and she's been talking with farm and landowners um, in the area about the conversion um, in private landowners to solar. So um, please come and stay tuned for that for now. Um, I think we've learned that there's